The Center for Science and the Public Interest called food dyes the rainbow of risk. Consumer Affairs reports American food and drink companies have stopped using potentially harmful artificial food dyes in foods sold overseas, but continue to use them in products sold in the U.S. In 2016, Dr. Rebecca Bevins, a cognitive neuroscientist, recorded a TED Talk on the effects of artificial food color, many of which, she notes, are made from petroleum products. Why are food manufacturers putting petroleum, like coal and tar, in our food? It all started in the late 1800s. Food coloring had always been limited and expensive, but the new petroleum-based colors were bright, resistant to fading, and most of all, cheap. A number of safety standards and tests were made to control consistency in uses and production in the years that followed, up through the 1930s. Many of these colors continued to pass safety standards put in place up until the 1960s and 70s, where cases and research simply became too controversial to continue their use. But many are still used today. Why? Because at this point, we, the consumers, have been taught that food should look a certain way. And manufacturers note that if they didn't use them, people wouldn't buy their products. But that's sort of the trouble, isn't it? The more dyes are used, the more we expect them. The more we expect them, the more manufacturers use them. The Harvard Business School published an article titled Standardized Color in the Food Industry, the Co-Creation of the Food Coloring Businesses in the United States, 1870 to 1940. It tells us, for many food manufacturers, synthetic dyes became one of the crucial ingredients to make food look enticing during the first decades of the 20th century. A 1906 article in the Confectioner's Journal described the coloring of foods as the natural and reasonable adornment of a product. The author noted that because people were surrounded by color in their everyday lives, it was natural for confectioners to find it necessary to tint their various creations in pleasing shades. And the idea spread. In 1930, Florida citrus growers began to color orange skins by soaking the fruit in synthetic color solutions to make the fruit look ripe. Food producers used synthetic dyes also for coloring such perishable items as fresh meat, salmon, and sweet potatoes. But even in the early 1900s, there was pushback and concern over dyed products. The Port of San Francisco denied entry of cherry fruit color from Germany because of poisonous substances. But manufacturers also pushed back with their own propaganda. At the 1906 annual convention, of the National Confectioners Association, the NCA's president expressed gratitude to H. Constum, a dye provider, for its persistent and highly intelligent efforts to overcome the prejudice of public officials against the use of harmless coal tar colors. To be fair, there have been attempts to discontinue dyes in some industries. At one point, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, and even beer producers were creating colorless versions of their products. 7-Up and Sprite have been clear for decades to separate themselves from competitors, and it worked great for them. The new clear products even did well in test groups, but on the market, the move was a commercial flop. People just didn't think it was real Coke and returned to their idea of what was real. This is despite the fact that no food coloring adds anything to the flavor, taste, texture, or quality of the product. There's no nutritional value either. And that's true for literally every food that uses dye. It's only there to make it look pretty. Dr. Bevins notes in her research that different colored dyes have certain and predictable reactions. She notes red 40, for example, is associated with hyperactivity, migraines, fidgeting, impulsiveness, buzzing in the brain, and is similar to ADHD. The effects can last up to two days. Yellow 5 and 6 causes anxiety, aggression, violent outbursts, and suicidal thoughts, similar to oppositional disorders, and lasts five days. Green 3 causes mania, hyperactivity, and feelings of euphoria, similar to bipolar disorder. The effects can last around 12 hours, according to her research. Blue 1 causes irritability, moodiness, and fatigue, and lasts 24 hours. 
Dr. Bevan's research also noted that 7.5% of children between the ages of 6 to 17 in the U.S. are on some sort of behavioral medication. That's 4.5 million children. 11% have been diagnosed with ADHD, and 14% will develop some sort of oppositional or defiant disorders. Ironically, many medications for behavioral problems contain these same artificial food colorings. But this is just the doctor's own observations from work with her son. It does not constitute a comprehensive study. And although some research supports her claims, not everyone agrees. Or maybe it's just the problem is harder to deal with than it is to ignore. The Delaney Amendments is a provision of the U.S. Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1958 which states no food additive shall be deemed safe after it is found to induce cancer when ingested by human beings or animals at any dose level. But a loophole allows some substances that were in use before regulations took effect to stay on the market. So some additives that were used before the Delaney Amendments passed are considered to have prior approval. According to an FDA spokesperson, that means they aren't regulated as food additives. And this includes the use of many food colorings. So what kind of effect does this have on our community? In comparing different nations and their respective numbers of behavioral disorders like ADHD and their association with food coloring, the United States has a rate of about 11%, about seventh in the world, of children to young adults being diagnosed with the disorder, according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The United Kingdom, which has banned the use of petroleum food dyes, has a rate less than half the U.S., at about 4%. Food colorings are banned in Norway, Finland, France, Austria, and the U.K., and the European Union requires the coloring agents to come with a warning label when sold in stores that says the dyes could cause, quote, an adverse effect on activity and attention in children. The Norwegian Patient Register for the years 2008 through 2011 reported ADHD at 2% for children and youth. A 2011 study found that French children also have an ADHD rate of about 4%, similar to the UK, and Finland, along with Japan, was noted as having the lowest rates of ADHD in the world, according to a report by the U.S. National Center for Biotechnology Information. And while Japan hasn't restricted the use of artificial dyes beyond one, yellow six, Japanese society and food culture is much different than Western countries, and even have companies that have pioneered natural food dyes derived from such produce as red cabbage since the 1960s, practices not adopted by Western counterparts to any significant degree. So isn't it interesting that every country that has banned the use of artificial food dyes has a rate of ADHD and ADD less than half that of the U.S. or other countries that also continue to use artificial food dyes. Dr. Oz reports, along with correlating studies at Columbia University and Harvard University, that removing foods and products that contain artificial food coloring can help relieve the symptoms of children already diagnosed with ADHD. Still, all this report can show is that there is a correlation between artificial food dyes and some behavioral disorders. Proof of harm is much harder to come by because of a variety of factors. But really, the lack of information shows us that research just hasn't been done and questions aren't being asked enough to gain much attention. It doesn't help that consensus is that the majority of children and adults aren't affected negatively by these color-enhancing additives. But let's be fair. Adults are far less likely to eat artificial food coloring than children, and some studies suggest there is significant effect on childhood development and brain function. Others, like this one from PubMed, suggest there might be a link to certain cancers, such as liver and kidney cancer. But not enough research has been done to show long-term effects, so our conclusion that these dyes are safe is largely based on incomplete information and assurances from those who have the most to gain from their continued use. And that's never hurt anyone, has it? According to Drug Watch, on average about 4,500 drugs and devices are pulled from U.S. shelves each year. The recalled products have U.S. Food and Drug Administration approval 
and in many cases are widely ingested, injected, or implanted before being recalled. The Journal of Ethics in August 2020 points out how mistakes in regulation and deception for the past 25 years have contributed to the opioid crisis in the U.S. An article by MedPage today discusses how for 50 years doctors were prescribing medications for diabetics without knowing their true effects on patients. The FDA only intervened to force drug manufacturers to conduct more studies in 2008, which found that many of the most popular drugs being issued to diabetics had the fewest benefits to patients. But the FDA's policy change only occurred because of their own misinterpretation of data. So even though the change was necessary and transformed the industry just in the past decade, it only came because of a mistake. What seems like common sense, a normal safety precaution that we would all normally expect and hope would be taking place without our asking, could have easily gone on ignored and rejected by the industry itself even today, if not for an error by the FDA. In another case, in 1990, the FDA promised to take steps to ban RED3 for all users, a dye known to cause cancer, but gave no timetable for such action. It is still on the market and used in many foods today. Perhaps the ban's delay is partly owed to lobbying on the part of the fruit cocktail industry, with no adequate substitute available to dye cherries fruit cocktail makers say their sales would drop by 40%. Over 29 tons of the color was certified for use in the FDA's 2006 first physical quarter. And these are just a few recent incidents causing mass harm to the public at risk for certain conditions. Another problem dye is red too, one of the original seven colors from 1907. It took till 1976 for federal regulations to take action against the health concern it had caused for over 50 years. As the health concerns have grown, some food companies have made statements for eliminating food dyes from their products, but the follow-through on such promises have been limited or remain unfulfilled at this time. Ultimately, it's up to us. Educating ourselves and choosing to buy products that don't use these substances is ultimately the best way to make them go away. And also, more public awareness is necessary. In 1976, when Red 2 was taken off the market, it created such a stir that manufacturers removed products of all kinds that had any sort of red in it, even if it wasn't Red 2, because they were too afraid that it would have a negative effect on sales. As a result, it took M&M until 1987 to finally add the red version of the candy back to the packages. That's all for this episode of Rexport Education. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, please leave a like and subscribe to support our continued efforts to bring you informative content. Have you had a bad experience with food coloring in your diet? Tell us about it in the comments, and please check out the description for links to additional resources on this subject. Until next time, stay active and stay healthy.